in Kenya and South Africa were closed indefinitely in March amid lockdown measures imposed to stop the spread of COVID-19. Much more than just institutions for learning, these schools provided food, activity, and a sense of purpose for young people. The result of these closures has been an increase in gang recruitment of youth for participation in organized crime. In this week's episode of Africa and the Global Illicit Economy from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime, we're in East and Southern Africa, where we cover a special report on how gangs in Kenya and South Africa have used lockdowns to target children for recruitment. I'm your host, Lindim Tongana. Cape Town, South Africa is home to 93 major gangs that range from 1,000 to 25,000 members each. But their size, strategy and involvement in criminal enterprises is known to change according to conditions on the ground. An inactive member of the Dixie Boys, a gang occupying the Manenberg Delft area of Cape Town, gave an account to the Safety Lab of how they adapted to the changing landscape of organized crime during his tenure. Just before I joined the Dixie Boys, I saw a huge increase in the numbers, with people coming to join from other places. When they saw the surge of growth in Delft, and that the Dixie Boys appeared to be operating successfully with their vehicles and guns, they wanted to join them. There was no guns in the beginning. There were also gangsters operating from nightclubs in Cape Town, and they were connected with overseas people. They came here and brought us stuff as well. Under the auspices of opening up a nightclub, they would call us for protection. Gangs started selling rock clothes and stuff. The gangs changed and grew bigger in 1998 and 1999. The cops began to sell guns to gangs on a big scale. The nightclub owners from Cape Town also hired street gangs to do their dirty work, stabbing and intimidation. The money from nightclubs was more, and taxation on shop owners in the area was also more. Gangs are also known to increase numbers through recruitment when turf wars ensue. The recruits often come from the younger members of the community whose age provides a strategic advantage. South African law states that children under the age of 10 do not have criminal capacity. This means that a child under 10 cannot be charged or arrested for an offence. Rukshana Parker is an analyst at the South and East Africa Organized Crime Observatory. The rationale behind this is that children under the ages of 10 lack psychological capacities for insight and self-control and therefore don't have this ability to appreciate the wrongfulness of their conduct and to act in accordance with this appreciation. Different rules apply to children older than 10 but under 18 years. But the general objective of South African law is that anyone below the age of 18 should not be prosecuted within the formal criminal system as adults are. And gangs in Cape Town have exploited this limited criminal liability. For gangs, minors are the ideal recruit. Sadly, they are considered a low-risk investment that yields a high return. And this is because the moment a gang recruits a child, They have a resource that does not attract attention from law enforcement, but still provides the gang the ability to participate in and profit from criminal activities. When you arrive at a crime scene, you don't automatically suspect the 7 or the 14-year-old, let alone think to search them. And I think it's also important to note that recently an amendment bill which changes the minimum age of criminal capacity from 10 to 12 has been signed into law, which I'm sure gangs will exploit even more. What are some of the other reasons gangs might target children for recruitment? What jobs are they typically given? In the beginning, they're used by gangs to keep a lookout for the police, to carry guns to shooters and to deliver illicit items. And then it progresses over time to more violent killings. So they keep a lookout for the police. And then it moves on to them becoming what we call a bookie. And that's loosely translated to springbok. And these children are called this because they run like springboks to deliver a gun to a shooter. So sometimes a gang will plan a shooting, let's say, three blocks away. 
you then have a number of children positioned in different streets who will run and pass the gun onto each other until it reaches the shooter. It's sort of like a relay team or conveyor belt. And once the shooting is done, the gun goes back to the children and they pass it on to each other to ensure that it's moved out of the vicinity before the police arrive. You find the children are then also used as shooters themselves. So a child will walk up to a gang member and then shoot him. And the gang member is taken by surprise because you don't automatically assume that the seemingly innocent child is there to shoot you. And when you do realize it, it's too late. And gangs operate on the principle of picking up blood. This means that if a gang member kills a member of a rival gang, then the rival gang must take revenge. In other words, the rival gang must pick up the blood of their fellow member that has fallen. So sometimes if a gang knows that a rival gang is going to retaliate and they don't want to lose any of the key members, they will send a child to the rival gang. The rival gang then kills the child and in doing so picks up the blood. The gang will then consider the debt to the rival gang as being paid. Another inactive gang member from the Sexy Boys of Mitchell's Plain explained what youth recruitment and picking up blood looked like during his days as a gang member. According to his account, he joined the Sexy Boys at 16 or 17 years old out of fascination for the gang lifestyle. When I entered the prison, the love of brotherhood was very important. Interlinks between gangs inside and outside. I went inside to become part of the 28 gang. I moved up the ranks of the outside gangs. Once you invite somebody to a meeting or a party, they become known and their confidence will rise. He knows he is someone. Income will allow everyone to have a good time on a Sunday. That is how we lock people in. If you live on one side but belong to the other gang, it's dangerous. You bring death because if your gang kills somebody, they all pick up that blood with you. If they find value in one gang, they sell out the gang. If you offer me something better, I will go with you. Poverty and the desire for a flashy lifestyle are common reasons that South African youth become involved in organized crime through gang activity. But Rukshana Parker presents an added layer. Some also spoke about the need for safety. Gangs bully and rob people in the community and youngsters then join gangs because they believe their gang will protect them from other gangs who try to intimidate them. Another reason is revenge. Sometimes someone's loved one is killed by a gang, so the person joins their rival gang to take revenge. And then you have some who see it as part of their culture, as part of becoming a man. For them, joining a gang is a normal progression in their lives. It's their identity. During South Africa's lockdown, there were images of gangs distributing food and other resources to communities in international media. Did this also impact the perception of gangs in these communities? During lockdown, homes have had no access to incomes. People are starving. So gangs would distribute money, groceries, medication and masks, etc. to families. It essentially became a competition between the gangs as to which gang can give more. Children then think that, okay, gang X is better because they could provide so many people with items and therefore they must be powerful. So working for them would be ideal because they would be able to take care of my family and I. What effect did school closures have on gang recruitment? Many of the schools on the Cape Flats run feeding schemes that would allow students to take food home to their families as well. And then they also had several after-school activity programs that were aimed at keeping children away from gangsterism. Teachers and other people in charge of the after-school activities would also be obliged to report any children they think are at risk of joining a gang so that some form of intervention could take place. But unfortunately, during lockdown, these support structures are absent and Many families are hungry, which we have seen has brought about an increase in the number of parents and guardians actually grooming their children to do work for gangs in return for food and money during the lockdown period. The South African government has gradually begun to reopen schools, 
What changes do you expect to see in recruitment trends because of this? Usually, youth in the secondary or high school would be involved in selling drugs at school and forming school gangs. I think now with the reopening of schools, the school gang problem is not going to be limited to high schools. We will see a number of school gangs forming in your lower grades in primary schools. During lockdown, these young children saw the gangs distributing food and aid to their families. They had more exposure to the gangs than before and will now be determined to form gangs at schools and sell drugs to prove to the main gangs that they are worthy of joining them. That was Rukshana Parker, an analyst at the South and East Africa Organized Crime Observatory of the GI. At the onset of government-imposed lockdowns in Kenya and South Africa, international news outlets reported ceasefires, truces, and an apparent decrease in gang-related activity. The two nations' most prominent criminal organizations seemingly went from drug dealing, theft, and violence to distributing care packages to vulnerable communities. But according to GI research, rather than turning their guns in as acts of charity, these criminal organizations simply adopted new strategies. One of the things we'd seen during lockdown is that because there were all these new restrictions in place, police were given all these new powers to kind of enforce quarantines, enforce curfews and so on. Julia Staniard is an analyst and the coordinator of the UNTOC Watch initiative at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. That also led to uptick in police brutality cases, judicial killings and corrupt police officers actually taking advantage of these new powers to extort people and so on. There's one aspect, which is the gangs have also got more kind of social sway over communities, but also the legitimacy and community trust in police has also dropped significantly in a lot of these places. So it's kind of those two things sort of work against each other. Julia, can you start by giving us an overview of the extent to which gangs in South Africa and Kenya are part of bigger organized criminal networks? So the situation, as our our research has explored in both South Africa and Kenya, is quite different. In Kenya, our research has found that gangs are connected to politics in quite a sophisticated way, and often gangs are used by politicians for various ends. In South Africa, gangs are incredibly powerful organizations, especially on the kind of localized level where their territories are. So not so much linked to politics in the same way that we see it in Kenya, but they are incredibly powerful in terms of controlling legal markets within their territories and having power over the communities in which they operate. Did the power of gangs, either in South Africa or Kenya, change during the lockdown periods this year? The lockdowns actually started on the same day, on the 27th of March, but the restrictions in place were quite different. In South Africa, one of the key things that we didn't see elsewhere was that they actually imposed a ban on tobacco products, for example. And this has had an impact for gangs because as we saw as the lockdown went on, gangs actually shifted to a really get a foothold in the illegal tobacco trade, which really shot up after the ban was imposed. So while this wasn't previously a major part of the kind of gang economy, it really did develop as lockdown went on and became a very lucrative new illegal market that gangs were able to monopolize. But one thing that we could see that was a parallel between both South Africa and Kenya was that we think that lockdown has really increased the power of the gangs in some ways. Because while people's legal livelihoods and jobs and ways of making money, a lot of people lost those under the lockdown. And, you know, a lot of people were going hungry. A lot of um, people who are in precarious work positions lost those forms of income. But at the same time, illegal markets and drugs, for example, those things carry on regardless of the lockdown and regardless of the legal restrictions. So gangs were actually able to capitalize on the same ways of making money that they always have and expand into new ones. So that means that relatively to people who aren't involved in these illegal markets, their economic power kind of increases. Considering just how difficult a time this has been for families across Africa, how have gangs operated as sources for the provision of basic resources during COVID-19? There's a lot of things that caught the headlines from South Africa and from Cape Town specifically, which was to do with gangs announcing that they'd formed a sort of truce during the lockdown period. Caught the headlines a lot. People in the communities 
and people from the gangs that we actually spoke to kind of saw this more as a sort of act and it's played to a larger audience, played to get a lot of media attention, but actually the violence didn't cease and this distribution of resources and food for money, for example, from gangs does come with a lot of strings attached that these people who have become reliant on gangs as a source of income, as a source of support, are then also expected to provide various services for them in some ways. We also saw examples in Kenya which were quite different in that some people were reported that gangs were being involved with distributing hand sanitizers, for example, and providing hand washing bays. We saw an example from Kibera, which is an area of Nairobi, as a way to you know, provide the kind of sanitary services in the pandemic that these sort of communities don't always have access to. One gang member we spoke to who had actually been involved with the hand washing bays in Kibera said that this was actually, for them, quite a good opportunity to get contact with young people that they could also recruit into the gangs. Collectively, it would seem then that gangs gained greater influence in their respective communities during this lockdown period. But as these restrictions and measures begin to be eased by governments of both South Africa and Kenya, what do you predict will happen to their influence? Well, if the lockdown has taught us anything, it's that these things are actually very hard to predict. There's some changes that we saw developing that we w- wouldn't really have been able to think about before the lockdown. This is such a new situation. But one thing that I possibly would say would be that one of the major things we've seen about gangs gaining more power during lockdown is because of the economic impact of coronavirus and the cessation of a lot of businesses and hit on the economy, which has allowed them to get this sort of greater power. And that's obviously not going away, even as the lockdown down eases. And it's similar in another respect in that we'd seen that they'd gained a lot more kind of new recruits and were able to get more young people to join gangs, partly connected to the closure of schools. That was Julia Staniard, an analyst here at the GI and the coordinator of our UN TOC Watch initiative. South African students may be resuming their studies soon, which could provide respite for those tempted by gang life but it may not break the cycle completely. Kenya's government has confirmed that its schools will remain closed until 2021. In Nakuru, Western Kenya, the country's most notorious gang, Confirm, has upped recruitment significantly, focusing specifically on children. A Confirm gang member explained their strategy in an interview with the Global Initiative. Casual interaction is one of the first steps we are taking. It helps us gauge the smart ones who can keep secrets. We then have them hang around us at the base, basically to get attracted to the lifestyle by seeing how our members live. They run small errands like purchasing airtime or snacks as a dry run. After a few weeks of random rewards for these errands, they are then tasked with sending messages and reporting the numbers that go through. A key strategy in our online money heist. And the gang's joining requirements are so simple that children as young as eight are able to make the cut with relative ease. Because Confirm is a gang that dwells more on getting information online, like on virtual kidnappings and on harassing people online. Joyce Kimani is the coordinator of the GI TOC Observatory for Eastern Horn of Africa at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. As long as you can write, as long as you can read numbers, you are given a list of shambled telephone numbers where you're supposed to send random messages. Aside from phone and online scams, what other jobs are children given in Kenyan gangs? Most of them are used to ferry gangs and even to ferry drugs. And in in the very serious gangs, we see them engaging in petty robbery where they would approach a woman in the streets and they come and they charm their way and before you realize it, you find that either you've lost your money or your purse or in some cases, they just come and they outright grab your possessions and they run away with it. So when, when they start, they're given simpler jobs, simpler tasks, but as you advance in age, you're given more complex. For example, the gang called Confirm, as you progress in age, you can now be able to start calling numbers and threatening the people at the end of the call and maybe telling them you're going to use information against them. A new Confirm member, let's call him Brian, aged 14, described his job as a new recruit to researchers at the GI. I ride bikes around the neighborhood and spy around. No one suspects anything because children ride bikes all the time. I give report of police operations for 100 Kenya shilling tip, like $1. 
Joyce, your most recent research has indicated an increase in gang recruitment of Kenyan youth. What are some of the reasons behind this? One of the main reasons, one of our biggest problem is the closure of schools for a whole year. No one anticipated that due to the COVID-19 virus. These are kids who are used to either getting pocket money from their parents or uh, people chipping in money. And now all of a sudden their source of income is cut. So most of them actually are going into gangs because they don't have money to sustain their kind of lifestyles. One of the biggest problems is older gang members are recruiting their siblings, their brothers, their sisters, and the world. Being confined in with a lot of idle time, they tend to lean towards or they tend to have these conversations with their older siblings. I think the other problem we currently have is the poverty levels that came with the coronavirus. So many people lost their jobs. And so we see kids, parents would provide for them. The parents would give them money. And then all of a sudden, the parents have lost their jobs. So they tend to join these gangs because they want the money that they used to earn before their parents became jobless. And what other strategies do gangs use to influence children into joining their ranks? One of the biggest problems we have is we have a lot of social places where gangs hang out. A place like Kibera, we've seen that gangs have created several hand-washing bays, which is a good thing. But what they're doing is they're aiming for people who come to the hand-washing bays and to water points. And in that, they engage these kids in conversations and they get to learn about them. For example, they ask them, what do you do? Would you like to earn some money? They come out as very noble, but in reality, what they're doing is they're convincing the young kids to join their team. Another thing that has become common in this corona period is they are distributing a lot of food bags and relief food. And so it's kind of they're buying loyalty from these kids. And so these are that all ways of recruitment, but they're gaining the numbers. They're gaining the numbers. And in six months, I recruited quite an army. When we spoke to Rukshana Parker in South Africa, she stated that gangs specifically look for younger recruits because they can't be prosecuted under South African law. Is there a similar situation in Kenya? The age of criminal responsibility in Kenya is only eight years. And so it's illegal for one to prosecute a child who is below eight years. And so gangs have been taking advantage of this age and really approaching very minor, very young kids in terms of asking them to traffic small arms, either to engage in drug trafficking. And they cannot be held liable or they cannot be prosecuted in court because of their age. Is it possible to quantify how many children have recently joined gangs as a result of COVID-19? It's, it's quite hard to quantify, but when we talk to gang members, because we've talked to several gang leaders when we were doing the article for the risk bulletin, and they would say we have like 100 new members, we have 150, 200. So we've not come up with a direct figure, but we know the numbers are high. They're slightly higher than what they had before the lockdown began. Considering these high numbers, what is Kenya's government doing to curb this mass recruitment of children into gangs? And in your opinion, what should be done about it? The Kenyan government is aware that there is this problem. Our security minister, he's called Fred Mantiangi, when the curfew started and the lockdown started, and he said he's really aware that there is this massive gang recruitment of young kids. But there's this feeling of no one wants to take responsibility, so we find that the kids are just tossed in the air and they have to find their way out. The government, through the local administration, knows the presence of these gangs. They have the information. They would know which kid has joined which gang because uh, our systems is up to the down level. We have chiefs and these chiefs have information regarding each and every household. But we feel like the government is not willing to go the extra mile to stop this recruitment. And how involved are these gangs in politics? Does this make it harder to address youth recruitment? The gangs we are addressing are really into the system. Let me give an example. During the Kenyan post-election violence in 2007, Mungiki Gang was literally used to massacre a lot of people. It was one of the gangs that uh, was really engaged into either threatening people or dismembering people or just causing mayhem. And they are believed to be sponsored by different politicians. For example, the Confirm Gang is known to be sponsored by non-politicians, non-members of parliament coming from an area called Nakuru. And what happens is every time these gang's members are arrested, these politicians come and they pay their bail and they set them free. And so there's been this tussle between the security organs and politicians because every time the police 
try to curb the gang problem, the politicians come and bail them out. So there's that tussle. And I think another bigger problem is these gangs have a way of getting into power. We've seen them grow and some of them are occupying different positions. For example, when we were doing the risk bulletin bit, we found out that in an area called Kisumu, some of these gang members that were given political positions and are now members of county assembly. So they are in the system. They they have the power. They control everything. They control businesses and they control even the politics of the day. So the problem keeps growing. That was Joyce Kimani, coordinator of the GITOC Observatory for East and Horn of Africa. COVID-19 lockdown restrictions imposed in South Africa and Kenya have put pressure on all facets of society. But some of the hardest hit have been the two nations' youngest citizens. Schools provide food, education and a future to youth in vulnerable communities. Gangs recognize the gap left by the absence of courses and classrooms and are recruiting children in higher numbers than before the pandemic. Despite reported truces, experts at the Global Initiative uncovered that gangs have simply changed strategy. When police violence and dissatisfaction with governments came to a head during lockdown, gangs took the opportunity to curry favor with members of the community by providing basic resources. That's it for this episode of Africa and the Global Illicit Economy. I'd like to thank our guests, Julia Stanyard, Rukshana Parker, and Joyce Kimani. To learn more about the topics covered in this episode, head over to the GI's website, www.globalinitiative.net, and check out the Civil Society Observatory of Illicit Economies in Eastern and Southern Africa, Risk Bulletin, Issue 11. While you're there, feel free to check out some of the GI's other publications. There's always more in store. You can also find last week's podcast, Mali's recent coup, and others such as Deep Dive, exploring organized crime or faces of assassination. Please take the time to leave a review, subscribe, and share the podcast on social media. It helps us get noticed and improve the show. You'll hear from us again in two weeks, where we'll be focusing on the illicit economy in North Africa and the Sahel. Until then... This podcast was produced by Alexandria Sahai Williams. I'm Lindim Tongana. Thanks for listening. <laughs>